Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is October 26, 2015, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, a restaurant owner in Indiana is offering a discount to customers who bring concealed firearms into his establishment after his restaurant was robbed at gunpoint over the weekend. Meanwhile, Republican presidential candidate Mike Huckabee says that gun stores should disobey an Obama executive order. Unapologetic, complete ignoring of such an order. Then, the decline of the middle class continues as a new study from the Social Security Administration shows that one out of every two working Americans makes less than $30,000 a year. And a school in Washington state has threatened to fire their football coach for post-game prayers. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Globalist social engineers are not just targeting us with propaganda. They are manipulating our genetics. We are being targeted at every level by estrogen mimickers that lower our testosterone and other hormones and natural compounds that the body needs. The key is to be aware of this attack and to fight back against it. After consulting top doctors, nutritionists, pharmacists, and others, we have developed what I believe is the ultimate non-GMO organic super male vitality formula sourced from powerful organic herbs harvested around the planet and then concentrated for maximum potency. I've always believed in nutrition and herbs. Super Male Vitality was developed to activate your body's own natural processes instead of using synthetic chemicals. Super Male Vitality by InfoWars Life is so powerful that I only take half the recommended dose. Visit InfoWarsLife.com today to secure your Super Male Vitality and other powerful products from InfoWars Life. You know, it was a couple years ago, myself and the crew, we went down to the city of San Antonio because people had been cited, you know, harassed for open carrying their rifles and their pistols. But, you know, in today's society, people are actually somewhat relieved when they know people are carrying in their establishments. And this is one such case. The restaurant offers discount to concealed carry patrons following a robbery. And this is Papa Roo owner Art Bouvier announced on Facebook Saturday night that an armed robber had walked in, threatened his employees, and stolen money. After the thief had made off with the money, the owner took to Facebook to announce that, until further notice, your concealed carry license earns you 25% off your meal when you dine in. And he responded to critics by saying, my restaurant, my wall, my business, I can give discounts to whomever I please. And that's exactly right, because there are many establishments that will bar you from having a handgun, whether it's concealed or open, but some places, such as this restaurant, they welcome that. And you'll see a lot of times police officers, may, they may frequent a restaurant or a gas station where they may get a free cup of coffee. And why do they do this? Because, yeah, they get the free cup. But also the people who work at the store, they feel better knowing that an officer is there and they come by on a routine basis. You know, and if that's the price of coffee, that's not a big deal to them. It's the same thing here. They want people to know that there are armed people there in the vicinity. Because that's what a lot of it is, you know, it's that deterrent, whether it's be visual or, you know, concealed, just like the Secret Service, for example. You go to the White House, what, you have snipers on the roof, they're very visible, but you also have plainclothes guys uh, when Obama's out, greeting crowds, whatever. You don't see a weapon on them, but you know they're packing, and just that alone is a huge deterrent for a lot of would-be offenders, a lot of people who would go there and try to kick up dust and so forth. And people understand this, so that's why you see more and more of these things happening more often. And now, speaking on another aspect of the gun debate, we now have Mike Huckabee. He says gun stores should disobey an Obama executive order. We continue to see the president coming out saying that he wants to ban this, he wants to ban that. And I continually run into people who keep saying, you guys are Republicans. Well, number one, I'm not a Republican, but let's say you Republicans keep saying that Obama's been trying to take away your guns. He's been in office for years now. He hasn't taken away anybody's firearms. Well, you know, probably because he's given them to Mexican drug cartels, but that's another story. Uh, but trying and failing to do something is still trying to do it. Just like if you run track and field and you do the pole vault, 
and you run up and you smack the bar and it falls down and you don't make it, you don't get the gold medal, you don't even get bronze, you still tried and failed. So when Obama comes out here, well, I want to ban this, and he says in the debates with Mitt Romney, he wants to ban AK-47s, AK-47 should be in the hands of soldiers, not in the hands of criminals, which I do agree they should not be in the hands of criminals, but you can't make somebody a criminal just by automatically owning a AK-47, most of which aren't even fully automatic. That's a big misconception that people have. They see movies and they go to some big box store like Academy or Cabela's and they assume that those rifles are fully automatic. The majority of them are not. And the only reason I say majority, because I think Cabela's does trade for some firearms. So they may temporarily have a fully automatic rifle in their midst, but it's not something that they normally stock. So trying and failing is still trying. So that's what I say to all the naysayers. But now Huckabee had to say this. He said, there should certainly be an absolute unapologetic just complete ignoring of such an order by those gun shop owners because the president can't make law. And this was said by the former Arkansas governor. And that's right, because if you go to many gun shops, I've been to multiple ones where they have a picture of Obama and it says gun salesman of the year or, you know, thanks Obama, you know, because every time he comes out and threatens something, whether it's uh, sanctions on AK-47s, you hear people talk about the Bushmasters or whatever else they want to sue Bushmaster and all this other silliness. What happens? The gun sales go through the roofs because people understand that passing laws is not going to stop people from doing horrible things. Just like you go back to the Old Testament, people used to kill each other with rocks and bricks. And what happened last week? A guy went into a church and tried to kill a pastor with a rock and a brick. You know, it, the human nature of violence has not changed. The human nature of ill intent has not changed. Just the tools have changed over time. But if you have the proper ill intent, you will pick up a brick and try to bash somebody's brains out. But luckily, the pastor was living in modern times and pulled out his pistol and shot the guy. And now he is still alive to tell the story. But with this Firearm Act, you know, we also have the Hearing Protection Act, which would allow people to have things such as suppressors on their firearms. And that's one of the big uh, no-nos for a lot of people or for the anti-gun groups. They say, well, if somebody has a gun, I want to hear them shooting at me. Well, number one, if the guy's a good shot, you're not going to hear a damn thing in the first place. But beyond that, you know, don't you want to have people who are fully aware of their surroundings and so forth? Just like uh, that's one of the big criticisms. If somebody pulls out a gun, it's not a police officer or a military personnel. They don't have confidence in that person's ability to hit the target. So if a guy, if I'm in a, in a restaurant, whatever, some kill, concealed uh, carrier pulls out his firearm, I want him to have all senses available to him to be able to accurately pinpoint his target so he can hear if somebody is walking by and may walk into a shot. Don't you want somebody who's fully capable to react to all those type of situations? But uh, I guess that just makes too much sense for some people. And now, talking about making sense, we've put, I don't know the hard numbers, but many, many people into prison, nonviolent non drug offenders. So these are people who, you know, been caught a few times, maybe they have, you know, a marijuana cigarette or, you know, a joint or whatever. But under the mandatory minimums, they've been caught two or three times. And now they put these people into prisons which is completely ridiculous. The notion that you would release somebody from prison who was a violent offender, an armed robber or a, a rapist or somebody to that sort, just so you can put these low level offenders into jail is absolutely ridiculous. But now we have a year after Philly pot law has changed, arrests are down. And it was the first citation. And it was a ceremonial kickoff of sorts after the city decriminalized possession of the use of small amounts of marijuana. In the years since the law took effect, arrests have fallen nearly 75%. And you see what happens when you just decriminalize it? Like once again, as I always talk about marijuana or any other drug, I'm not encouraging people to go out and take it for recreational purposes. I definitely uh, recognize medicinal purposes. I have no issue with that. But I'm not telling you to go out and smoke it just to smoke it. But if you decriminalize the thing, now you don't have people filling into your jails. These are, you know, a lot of times young people who get caught up in a mix. Uh, case in point, I can't remember, I guess it was Jeb's daughter. I know she was a member of the Bush family. She's a young lady who got caught up with some drug charges. I think it was something a little bit more serious than marijuana, but she got caught up nonetheless. And the Bush family came out and said, hey, this is a young lady, she made a mistake, you know, back in her youth. She shouldn't be demonized, she shouldn't be criminalized, penalized for the rest of her life for a choice she made years prior. And I agree with that 100% Bush family. And I don't agree with most of the stuff they say, but I do agree with that. With that said, if you grant that courtesy to your daughter, to your niece, to your granddaughter, you should allow that for the rest of the people in the United States of America and not put people into prisons for doing these low-level crimes that didn't hurt anybody but themselves. 
So, Bush family, if you're going to give that courtesy to your daughter, to your family member, please give that to everybody else in the United States of America. Now, when I was a kid, you know, I played football, played a lot of sports. And a lot of times we would have a, a halftime prayer, a beginning of the game prayer, games, uh, prayers of practice and all that stuff. And it wasn't that big of a deal. You know, the coach said, hey, guys, let's take a knee. If you don't want to participate, you don't have to participate. And I can't recall anybody ever getting up and leaving, but the coach always told people, hey, if you don't feel comfortable with this, if this goes against your whatever beliefs, you're welcome to step out. You know, no harm against you. But now people are coming down very hard. You know, and we live in a society where you can take a bunch of kids to a sex shop without parental consent and have them, you know, play with dildos and all that stuff. But if they want to have a knee, you know, Tebow, as they call it nowadays, if they want to Tebow a practice, that is just way too much. And now we have this Fox News story about this issue. He, he went out there by himself and took a knee and bowed his head. And the students are the ones that decided that they wanted to join him. In fact, they asked him permission if they could join him. And he said it was a free country, that they can do what they please. And so now, you know, given everything that's happening in our nation right now, and especially in our public schools, uh, it, it just it's shocking that a school district would want to, would want to try to criminalize uh, what Coach Kennedy is doing, which is really just trying to to be thankful for player safety on the field. And to anybody who would say that they're forcing this on the kids, they're forcing the religion on the kids. Or well, what about all these, you know, transgender bathrooms and all these other things that we see going on in the schools? Isn't that forcing a type of sexuality onto the children? Because I'm not talking about a unisex bathroom that you might see in the airport, right? It's a one person bathroom, a man comes in, leaves, and then the next, a woman goes in, leaves there in there by themselves. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, you know, young ladies being in the restroom and there's some guy in there pissing on the seat. You know, you're forcing that on the young ladies, but you don't say, well, let's ban this, or let's keep a bathroom for the boys and a bathroom for the girls. They want to mix all this stuff in together, but they'll come out to religion and say that you're infringing on these kids' rights, you're trying to force things on them, just like I gave the example earlier. In my school, like I said, I don't know how it is all around the country, but when I was a young man growing up playing sports, you didn't have to participate in the prayer. It was just there for those who wish to participate in it. And what about participating in your finances? And we have a new article from the Daily Caller. One in two working Americans make less than $30,000 a year. 51% of working Americans make less than $30,000 a year. New data from the Social Security Administration shows that's $2,500 a month before taxes and just over the federal poverty line for a family of five. The wage index doesn't take into account the 8 million Americans who are unemployed or the tens of millions of working age Americans who are not participating in the jobs market. Yeah, and this is a very big deal because you think about for a family of five, $30,000 is not a lot of money at all. It's definitely not a lot of money for a, uh, a single individual. So imagine trying to raise all your children on this system. You know, what are you going to do? A lot of people turn to food stamps and other type of government subsidies. And I'm not saying they're bad in and of themselves. I'm just saying you don't want to be dependent on that government handout in order to uh, feed your family and do everything that you have to do. In addition to this, we also see people cutting their hours. You know, famously, uh, Walmart has done it. Not saying that I'm vouching for everything Walmart's been doing, but because of things like Obamacare, they're trying to keep people under a certain hour so they can't go up and hit those uh, Obamacare rates. And of course, you know, you need things like uh, insurance, um, all the medical aid you need for, especially if you have a young family, uh, the kids that break their legs, they need braces, all these other type of things. And now they have the hours cut, not just because of, you know, a bad economy and all that stuff, but also uh, things going on in the insurance arena. So this is very uh, concerning to anybody who's out there trying to raise their family on such a low rate. You know, you may be one of those people yourselves and you just got to do the best you can. You know, there's no uh, one size fits all simple solution to this. You just try to make the best you can with what you have to work with. And as we're talking about this, this also leads to a lot of homeless issues because imagine you have those five kids making $30,000 a year. What are you going to do? A lot of people like said they end up homeless or under some type of subsidy. And this is bureaucracy at its best, where somebody can come together or a community can come together. They say, hey, we're going to pull our resources. We're going to actually build some small houses for homeless people to live in. And what happens? They send the police to come and knock the whole house down, just like the three little pigs. Let's take a look. In an effort to provide affordable housing, Denver Homeless Out Loud spent Saturday putting up these micro homes in a vacant space of Denver Housing Authority's community garden, building them hand in hand with the homeless people who planned to use them. But they didn't have permission. Police kicked them out for trespassing and arrested the 10 who refused.